Okay. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome back to my shop. It is time for another live video. And uh, since I wasn't immediately on the airplane right before this, we're actually gonna get back into doing the build on the turning saw, which I'm looking forward to. We're gonna be putting handles on it tonight. Uh, but a little bit of uh, housekeeping to let you know about what's going on. I just got back from my trip out west, and I had a video on a Tally Ho project that I was working on when I was out there, and so that should be coming out, and I'll have a video coming out hopefully Thursday uh, talking about the Pacific Northwest uh, tool collectors. And I'm also hoping to have a big compilation of all of the places that I know of where you can buy antique hand tools. Um, so um, stores, um, antique stores, stores that are specific to it, um, tool meets, um, other conventions and things like that that sell tools and then putting it all into a map so you can see it. And I have a bunch of places in Australia and in Europe um, and I'm trying to collect them from other people. So if you know of some place like that you'd like to have on the map, uh, let me know and we will try and get that on. Put it down in the comments or send me an email. Uh, but hopefully I'll be releasing that on Thursday. So keep your eyes and ears open for that. That should be something a lot of people have been looking forward to. Uh, so other things coming up. Uh, let's see, this month, the 27th through the 29th, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, is the Midwest Tool Collectors National Meet. And this is the biggest place in the entire world to buy hand tools. And I am not joking when I'm saying it is the largest collection of hand tools for sale at any given time and usually um, in the entire world. So it is well worth it. People travel from all over the United States and in many cases uh, from around the world to come to one of these. So I'm really looking forward to that. If you want to find out more, go to mwtca.org, uh, mwtca.org, and you have to become a member in order to be uh, in order to, to come to the events. But you can show up at the door and become a member right at the door, and then go in and, and buy things. So it is well worth it. I'm hoping my wife will be there. Still working on a couple things with her work. Maybe we'll make it work. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, let's see. Then I'm still waiting on some of the final information on October 20th. I'm doing a tool meet down in Austin, Texas, and also teaching a class down there about dovetails. So I'm looking forward to doing that as well. Uh, and then, of course, Maker's, Center, Maker's Central coming up in May. I just purchased uh, flight for that. So I'll be in uh, the UK, and my wife will be there with me. So those of you in the UK and Europe going to Maker's Central or from around the world going to Maker's Central, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Poof, that was a lot. Um, Anything I'm forgetting? Probably not. No, I probably am. <laughs> Let's get into the build today. Um, so, last time we actually got a functioning saw. This is built up and twisted together. The only thing is we're missing the handles and we have to do detail and carving and making this a pretty working saw. Uh, so let's actually take a look at this a little bit closer. So here you can see uh, this is a bow saw or a turning saw because it is a small blade it allows you to actually turn and you have a knob on here so you can turn the blade. And in this case I actually just made this knob as a test. I have a little bit more detailing I want to do on it but I like this shape as opposed to a turned knob. Um, originally I was planning on turning one but then I thought you know I really like this um, this almost like a crystal um, chamfered shape. So I'm kind of playing with that idea. I think I'm going to make the chamfers on the outside here much bigger uh, but I haven't gotten to that uh, yet. So today we're going to be making the handle from the other side. Now traditionally or somewhat normally the two knobs are actually different sizes because one you might use as a handle to, to grab onto and the other one is more or less just a knob for turning the saw blade. And so one of them is usually more like a file handle and the other one is more like a, a plain tote knob. Uh, in this case I'm going to be doing something very similar but rather than turning them and making them round like that I'm actually going to be shaping them more like this. This is what we're going to be doing today, only we're working on the bigger one over here. For the wood, I'm going to be using live oak. And this is actually a chunk that I got from um, when I was out Tally Ho. And this is what the, the boat there is made of. A gorgeous piece of wood, and live oak is just its beautiful. It's got all this swirl and grain. And no matter what you do, it's, it's, it's quickly becoming one of my favorite woods to work with. So. What we need to do is take this block, make it into a smaller block, and then we can start shaping it down into the handle. Um, so the first thing I need to do is actually rip it down because I want it to be uh, an inch and a quarter by an inch and a quarter so that it all well, fits. Uh, and then I need to actually rip this down. So right now it's an inch and a quarter this way. I need it to be an inch and a quarter this way. So we're going to be using my big 
um, handsaw. Uh, I could use my big frame saw, but we're going to use the, the handsaw today because I don't have enough space to bring my, uh, my frame saw out. So let's set this up. I'm going to put it here in the vise. Actually, I'm going to back the saw this up a little bit. I don't know if you guys can see me. Probably not. Oh no, camera's out. It's like... Here, let's go back to two. Hi. Two, yep, you're good. Um, so I'm going to set this up in here. And I'm going to put it on the end of my vise. Tilt this down a little bit. I was going to say, we're seeing about. like half your... I'm going to put this down on the end of the vise here so that I can actually cut all the way down the face. Uh, it's too small to do in a tool and a saw bench. I also need to use a marking gauge here to mark my line across the top to start with. And I'm going to be using a big tooth saw. This is a, uh, I think, 5 PPI rip uh, handsaw. It will leave a fairly ragged cut, but that's okay. I'm going to be planing this down and cutting off some more in the future. So let's start this cut. Slowly work it back across the line. With big teeth like this, you have to be careful to lift the weight off. And you can see how it was kind of stopping in that cut. It was because I was putting too much force into it. I was actually trying to force the saw down into the cut. You actually just want to let the saw do the work itself. Let the weight of the saw be all the pressure it needs. And we can cut down that line. And holy cow, live oak is a lot of work. This stuff is gnarly. And, whew. Okay, I'm going off the lines. I'm gonna flip this over. Wow, I was putting too much pressure into it and twisting the saw. So every now and then, if you see that you're starting to go astray, flip it over and cut from the other side. In this case, it's not gonna make much difference because I'm planing all this down. I'm just getting rid of a lot of material to make the planing easier. I have a tooth somewhere here that's a little bit longer than the others. You notice every time I'll stop right there because that tooth is catching. I need to clean that up here sometime. Probably one tooth that got bent out of shape and it's catching on the side. Ta-da! A very roughly cut board. Now I want to clean this up. And to do so, I'm going to grab this. This is usually my smoothing plane, but because live oak is so gnarly and twisted, I need to use a plane that isn't going to cause problems and tear out. And this plane is set up with a very fine mouth and a chip breaker really nice and close to everything, so I can get a nice clean surface on there. That's cleaner than I need, so now it's approximately an inch and a quarter by an inch and a quarter by an inch and a quarter by that long. Now, how long a handle do I want? It's saying that it should be three and seven eighths, and this is like, uh, what, f almost five inches long? But I have a bigger hand than most people, so I think I'm going to cut off um, about a half inch or so on this, just to make it a little bit smaller, but make it bigger than what's in the picture. So I'm going to use a square on here. Draw a line. And then draw another line here. I'm just going to use these two lines to judge my marks. So I could go all the way around, but because I haven't planed this all up, the chances of my square being actually squared to anything are pretty sad. So I'll put that on here grab my carcass saw and cut that down. Start on the far side of the line from myself. Ooh. Well, that got off the mark quickly. There we go. And then cut down the line.
making a little board out of a big board. Any questions as I'm going along that are pertinent? Well, the only question I've had so far, um, well, two of them, both were from Mr. Q. One, did you know about any swaps in Georgia slash South Carolina area? I thought you yes. gone to Atlanta once. There are many, and there will be coming out on that map I'm telling you about. Um, and and then yes. he was talking about your Packers shirt, and I was going to say, yes, you were probably wearing a Packers shirt. Yes, <laughs> I am a Packers owner. Yes. I love being able to say that I own a national football team. Where's the block go? Oh, there it is. <laughs> You're just a tad fuzzy, by the way. What's that? You're just a tad fuzzy. Am I? Let me see. I'm probably way out of focus. Oh, yeah. There, that's going to make it a little bit better. Ta-da! Well, I'm normally fuzzy, just my fuzzy personality. <laughs> Okay, so the next thing we want to do, um, before I actually go and shape this, I want to do a little bit of detail work on one end. And this is something I ran into when making this knob, is because this is so small, it was something I couldn't actually clamp in the vise and work on. So I actually want to do the chamfer and the ends of this before I start doing all the work on the rest of the shank. So what we're going to do is take this and put it in the vise and work on the end of it before working on the main face of it. Switch back over to this camera. And move this in a little bit tighter on here. So I'm gonna grab, ooh, I forgot to sharpen this beforehand. Surprise. I'm grab this, my low angle here. And I'm gonna chamfer off the back corner just a little bit so that when I run across the top of this, I'm not going to be blowing out the fibers in the back. I'm just going to clean it down until I get a nice clean surface on top here. Just like that. And so this will then become the end of my knob. Now, in this case, I had a problem of making these chamfers much bigger because I was having to do them by hand and holding onto this while planing it. So I want to do the chamfers on this before I start actually shaping it. I'm going to raise it up higher in this, and then bring the plane in and chamfer it this way. This is much, much faster. And I'm just looking until the chamfer looks pleasing to me. And then I'll just duplicate that chamfer on the opposite side. I like to go opposite sides first and then make the closer sides match. Any other questions while I'm doing this? Yes, uh, Brian Rust has said, this may have been asked before, but could you give me some info on that smoothing plane? I've seen it in multiple videos and have wondered if it is new or oldish and who made it. Uh, that is made by Veritas. It is the Veritas custom plane, and you can actually buy it and customize the angle of the frog, the type of the steel, the knob, the tote, and you can actually make this exactly what you want. But you can buy it new from Veritas. It is my absolute favorite plane of all time. And so now that I've done this side and this side, I'm just bringing back the chamfer until it matches these corners. Just there. And then on this corner, I'm going until that facet goes from this corner to that exact corner there. Just need to do a little bit more back here. There. Um, let's do this one a little bit more. And now I'm going to start chasing this around, going after perfection. And I'm going to be getting fairly close here, at least by eye and what I'm looking for at the moment. A little bit more. 
that'll do. So there is the end of the pommel uh, that I'll be doing into it. Now the next thing I want to do is taper this all down. I want it to be about a uh, three-quarter inch by three-quarter inch at this end and all the way out to the corner on this end. So let's zoom out a little bit so you can see this a little bit more. Now what I want to do is use a uh, back saw pull that out, to actually cut down on an angle right here. So in order to do that, I need to mark this out. And to mark it out, I'm going to grab a marking gauge. And I already have this set. It's about 3 8 or so from the fence to the point. And on the opposite end, I'm going to use that to mark all the way around inside the end. And this will be a square, basically the exact shape I want the end of this to eventually be. So I need to remove all the material down to this line and draw a line from there out to here. Now because I drew that line, I now have a point here that I can draw a line from there to this corner and cut down in that line. That's a lot of lines I'm talking about. <laughs> um, let me just make sure I'm thinking through this correctly before I go in. Oh, and the other thing I want to do before I go any farther is while I have this here, I want to actually get a center point on this end because eventually I'm going to be drilling a hole here for the connector to go onto. So I'm going to draw a line from corner to corner. And then I'm going to draw a line from corner to corner. This way I have that center point ready to go for when I drill that out. So let us draw some lines and grab a pencil. Where did my pencil go? Right behind your ear now. Yeah, it's usually behind my ear. Here, I got one I can throw at you. And your saw? Where is my pencil? Do any of you see my pencil? I have one. You have a pencil? I have one. Oh, well, I was going to throw it at you. <laughs> yeah, Snap the fun. lead before it gets down there. Hey, yeah. while you're working on that, What's Colored that? Squid wants to know if you've ever worked with Cypress before. Um, I have not. I have not worked with Cypress. There you go, you got your answer. Um, I've been told it's similar to cedar, but I do not know. <coughs> I uh, hand to a woodworker's pencil sharpener, a block plane. It gives you a square shape to your uh, your lead. I like it. So um, let's switch back to this one and show you what I'm talking about here. So now that I have these lines on here, I know this is a rare thing. I'm actually going to work with a pencil. I'm going to set up the square from that line to the tip and then draw a line on here. Now I could grab the plane. Actually, I'm going to do that on one of these. I'm going to, I'm going to plane down a surface just to show you what that's like. And on the rest of them, I'm probably going to saw them just because I am a glutton for punishment. Just ask my wife. No, I do crazy, like stupid things because I want to. Yeah. And I'm going to put this in here at that angle. And I'm going to grab this plane and just start hogging off material back at this end where I want to take more material off. Not going very far forward. I'm keeping an eye on that line, and I'm not even making a dent in this yet, so I'm going to get something heavier. Let's grab this plane. This will take off a heavier cut. Whew. Now I'm sweating. Any questions while I do this? No, I was just thinking if you had the right tempo, you know. <laughs> no, but Duck said he found his pencil in the living room couch under the cushions. Oh, yeah. There's, there's, there should look there. Yeah, I'll also notice you're getting these dark spots on here. That's from the steel rubbing off on this really hard wood. Um, so you're actually getting, the steel is hard enough to actually be a buffing compound all by itself because it's actually 
I'm grinding off a tiny bit of steel. All right, I have a question. Tyler Kimball wants to know, what is your favorite block plane? Um, I don't use block planes that much. Well, I, I do use them quite a bit, but just about any block plane works well. Um, every block plane has its pros and cons, so I really don't have a, a personal block plane that I say, yes, this is my favorite. I try not to use a block plane if at all possible because I find them to be slightly annoying to me personally, but there are some things where block planes are just perfect. Okay, now that we're close, I'm going to come back to this low angle and flatten out that side. Almost down to the line there and there. Just a little farther to go. There. Now we have one side done. And I'm out of breath. So now that I'm doing that, I could keep going on and doing the other sides or I could use a saw to cut them off. So let me show you how I go about doing that. It takes a little bit more time to set it up because it's a hard thing to hold on to, but it gets rid of most of the material quickly. Okay, you're just a little fuzzy, I feel like. Okay. Just a tad or so. Is that better? It's like the, the eye doctor. One, <laughs> so let's move away a couple of planes here. Wow, we're actually running out of time. This is a surprisingly tedious step. Um, it would take even, well, if I had a good um, lathe or power lathe, it would be very quick to throw it on the lathe and turn it and be done with it. Um, but with a spring pull lathe, it would probably take even longer unless I had things set up and perfect and running on it. So the next thing I'm going to do is grab my bench hook and cut it on the bench hook. I'm also going to grab a wooden hand screw. Oop, wrong way. And I'm going to use this to hold it in place because it'll want to move around on me. Let's see if that's enough. Eh, that's close enough. And then I'm going to use this to crank down on it. And then I'm going to grab my, I'm going to grab my tenon saw to do this because it has a rip cut tooth. And I'm going to be basically ripping here. Set up this camera to give you a better view of it. There we go. And two. So now I can start on the side away from me, put it right on that line, and work back along that line to my side. Once the cut is established, then run right on down. Helps if I lock my bench hook in place. I'm wondering why it's moving all over the place. And if things go well, it will track right down this and I'll have a really nice clean cut that I can clean up with a few passes of plane and be done with it. Things don't always go well, so we'll see how this one does. I like that. I'm also trying to make sure I go all the way through the cut so that as these teeth get loaded up in here, because it's a long cut, I want them to be able to dump out dust when they come out here, and vice versa, come all the way back past the cut. Ta-da! Get rid of most of the material. 
So then I can bring it back over here, lock it in. Here, swing that back around for you. And then before I go any farther, I'm going to plane this side off so that it is not a problem for future. Smooth this side down. There we go. And the two sides done. Time to do the next one. And this one will be a little easier because there's less material to go through. So I'm going to do the exact same thing again. Set it on this line. Set it on that corner. Draw my line and keep going. Any questions right now? Oh, we've had several. Oh, let me find them because I forgot to mention the blue dot thing at the beginning. But Doc oh, reminded yeah. everybody. If uh, um, you want to have a question, put a blue dot or something very obvious so that my wife can catch it. Especially Otherwise, after they working tend to 12 hours. My eyes are not as good as they <laughs> usually are. Um, let's see. William Mueller said, Hi, James. Met you at the Fredericksburg Woodworking Guild. My question is, which is better for hardwood, bevel up or down? Um, it depends. Um, bevel up and bevel down really don't have a huge amount to do with hardwood or softwood. Um, they have more to do with the difficulty of the wood. And in both cases, you're more or less wondering what the angle of the bevel is. Uh, most bevel down are um, higher angle and most bevel up are lower angle, but that's not always the case. Um, bevel, uh, excuse me, bevel up tend to be easier to push. So some people really like those, but uh, as to hardwood and softwood, they don't really have a huge amount of application directly to one or the other, unless you're talking about particular like curly or figured wood, in which case then usually the higher angle bevel down is the way to go for your figured woods. getting hard to push. Let's put some paste wax on this. Every now and then the saw gets really nice and shiny here. You just put a little bit of wax on here. Oh wow, it's so hot that it's melting it. Just put that on there and it will run 100% smoother. Oh yeah. Just like that. Flip it over, do the same thing on the other side, and then we can go clean off these with the plane. Any other questions right now? I do, but I don't know if they can hear you over this. Oh, uh, okay. Let me finish this cut. I don't know why, but I like doing things the hard way most of the time. And it sometimes cuts like this that I'm like, mm, you know, I wish I had a bandsaw. I could just take it over to and run that cut. But I don't. So I'm going to use this. clean these up. Now the problem with cleaning them up is I can't hold this in a vise this way now because it's got this corner and everything wobbles around. So I want to hold on to these wedges and use those to actually clamp this in place. So I can set this in here and then we're going to plane it down. So I can probably answer some questions right now. All right so let's see next is kayak kid seven. I live in southeast Alaska, and we have yellow cedar, Italian cypress, and western red cedar. Would your, what would your opinion be on making a workbench top out of solid chunk, uh, out of a solid chunk of red cedar? Um, yeah, that would be good. Uh, my old bench is made out of Douglas fir, fairly similar. Douglas fir is a little bit harder, not that much though. Um, so that would be very good. The only thing you have to worry about with a solid chunk is it's got to be really darn dry. 
Um, you want to let that sit for a while. Otherwise, if it has any moisture, it will change. That solid chunk will warp big time um, when you bring it down in and actually uh, connect things together. So you may find up like a year later, your, your whole bench is twisted because the, the block dried. So be careful of that. But yeah, that would make a really cool, really cool bench. So like this plane right here is a bevel up, excuse me, a bevel down, very high angle plane. I'm shooting at like 55 degrees. And my grain is turning on me, so I have to turn around and go the other direction. There. That's side two. Now let's do side three. And then we can move on to the last bit of chamfer and then attach the hardware to it. It's kind of funny to think this wood grew in Georgia and then was shipped out to Washington where it was worked on there and it was made as scrap out for the plane, or for the boat. And then I pulled this scrap and brought it back. So I'm gonna show you guys a little trick I have. Whenever you're working with something little like this, it's hard to hold on to, especially with a tapered angle, to hold it in the vise and work on it with a plane. So it's sometimes easier to take the work to the plane as opposed to taking the plane to the work. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna turn it into a Cooper's plane and flip it upside down and lock it in the vise. Now there's a couple things you have to worry about when locking a plane in the vise. Let me back this out just a little bit is that you have to make sure you don't break the plane. Because if I put this in right here and clamp it, and it's actually going to clamp on these wings, I could actually break those wings off. I want to make sure that it's down flush with the surface so that I'm clamping, ow, not my fingers, so that I'm clamping the sole and not the wings. Then once it's in there, I can very carefully take the work across the plane. You just have to be careful because every now and then you'll see these red streaks coming out. They look really beautiful. And you're wondering, what is all this red coming out of? Is the red coming out of the wood? Where is the red coming from? And you suddenly realize, oh, I'm leaking. So I'm going to put a heavy chamfer. I'm not going to put basically an entire facet. I want something like a little bit more than that. Just a hair more. Trying to keep it nice and flat and even. There, that's about the surface I'm looking for. Rotate it and do the next one. Any questions now? Yes, let's see. Um, Jimmy O said, should you be able to use a regular plane to do most, if not all of the things a block plane can do? And if not, what plane should I get first? Yes. Um, you can use a number four, number five to do anything a block plane can do, mostly. 99% of the work. Uh, sometimes they just become awkward when you're trying to hold them one-handed and do little detail things. That's where a block plane can be very useful. Um, and normally I'm going to say the number four is probably the most important plane you can get. Uh, the number four is one that will do pretty much anything you want. Number five uh, well, some people will say that because it's often called the jack plane. It's long enough you can joint with, short enough you can smooth with. Uh, so it's more or less a personal preference. But most of the time, if you actually want to do some hand woodworking, the first plane you should get is a number four or number five. Uh, the only time I would say a block plane is it can be very useful to someone who's predominantly a power tool user. It is a very good crossover tool. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Let's see. Um, Duck says, has James looked at the Veritas low angle block plane with the available tote so it turns into a low angle number three? Um, I have looked at it. I've played with it a little bit. I've never actually used it in any particular project. Looks interesting. Um, would be kind of fun to play with, uh, to actually 
have in the shop and see what it feels like, but I've never, never had a need for it. So maybe someday. There, I've got a chamfer now on all four sides. I'm gonna put a slight chamfer here on the front edge. Just about that. Keep going. Any others? Um, let's see there. Wood Beetle Woodwork says, does Mrs. Wright get to touch the tools and do you ever teach her anything? Yes, she can touch the tools anytime she wants. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'd like to. We actually want to do a, a series here sometime and kind of do like how to, how to for beginners and take her through the basics. Uh, and actually, so I would teach her and video it and I thought that would be great information. Uh, I haven't quite figured out how we want to do that yet, but it is on the list. Then once I do the four main sides, I'm also going to come back through and do the corners. Those will just take a little bit less force. And a little bit more on that one. Perfect. Now, just kind of detailing out a bit of these chamfers getting them to something more that I like. I think that's pretty good. I like that shape. That is what I'm looking for. So the next thing we need to do is drill a hole here for the hardware to go into. And let me grab that. Because we need to actually socket this onto there. So let's do that. Move a few things around and set that up. How are we doing? Oh, we're doing good on time. Good. No reason to rush. Can I ask you another question? Sure. So Color Squid asks, have you ever wanted to make one of those little round shaker boxes? Uh, the oval shaker boxes. Yeah, I thought about making those. I actually have an uncle that uh, he made those for a while as kind of a, a part of his living. At least I underst understood he did that. They would be kind of fun. Um, they're not high on my list, so probably won't do it for a long time, but someday I might. Um, oh, let me show you this before I move on, is that sometimes, and particularly with these hardwoods, I was showing you how the metal actually rubs off, and you get these black stop spots. They actually look like um, wood burning from a saw. So you can just come back in with a file and clean off those black spots. And I'm going to do this later after, uh, just before finishing, and just actually clean it all up and make sure that I don't get anything. Those black spots are just spots where the wood is hard enough to actually grind some of the steel and leave the residue on there. So I'll hit most of those later, but I thought I'd show you that. I'm going to need to clamp it up here in the vise and try and clamp it so that it's tight and vertical because we're going to drill this out. Another question? Um, well, I think everybody asked it, but uh, purpose of paste wax, I think they answered it, but just to hear your opinion. Uh, the paste wax on the saw uh, lubricates the saw so it moves back and forth. It's less chance that the cut is actually gonna bind on the plate, allows it to move through it easily. Um, just makes it much easier to push. So, I'll pull this out. We've got to get this piece of hardware into that. So let's put this back over here. Now I'm going to grab, I have a brace and bit set up. Yes, I do. Right here. Um, a brace with a quarter inch bit. It's all gunky right now. I need to clean that up. Why are you so gunky? Um, because I just used it a minute ago. So let me set this up on here. Show you what I've got. Now, I love this little auger, and I wish I could find an entire set like this because it's a much shorter auger than average, and um, it cuts beautifully. And I've done, I've tried to maintain the screw as much as humanly possible. And I want to make sure that I clean the screw out because it's the lead screw that makes cutting with an auger so easy. The screw is what actually pulls the auger in, in the, through the bit and through the cut. 
you don't want to be pushing the auger. If you have to do that, it's usually because it's dull and you need to sharpen it. So I'm going to clean it up, get all that off it, and set this up a little higher. I'm going to set this into that X that I made earlier. Now that that X is useful, and I'm going to start that lead screw down into the wood. And I'm going to put my forehead on top of this and eyeball it this way. Once I go down just a little ways, I'm going to stop. I'm going to look at it from the side and I'm going to see if it's vertical this way. And I'll look at it from the other side. I'm just going to eyeball it all the way around, make sure that it's nice and vertical, and then continue the drilling. And this stuff is so hard that the pieces come out of there almost like they would from a steel cut, come out in these beautiful curls. Uh, such an interesting wood. A little more. I'm just kind of eyeballing this cut because I can make it a little deeper than it has to be. And once I'm down deep enough, what I want to do is back it up a little ways and then pull up on the drill and keep drilling forward. That way I keep the curls coming out because I want to make sure that I pull up all this junk with me. I don't want to leave it down in there clogging up the hole. So I'm going to go back down in, clean it out a little more, get up all that junk that was down in there. And this, I picked this particular bit because it's a very, very tight fit. Um, I can pound this down in, but it's not going to come out easily. Now we're going to mix up some epoxy and drive this down in. So I'm doing that, it'd be a good time for any questions. All Ooh, right, lots of circles and diamonds. Well, <laughs> why did I say yeah. something crazy? No, like you know, duck and then Jimmy found it, so I think we're good. Um, <laughs> let's see. Duck says, "What's the difference between white oak and live oak?" Um, two different species of oak. Actually, I think from what I understand, uh, live oak isn't actually an oak. Um, it's a species of another tree from Merkley. Um, but the wood looks and acts just like oak, so it wouldn't surprise me if it wasn't actually an oak. Um, but live oak actually keeps the leaves all year round. So it is a leafed tree, but uh, they, don't, uh, they don't fall all in the fall. So it's kind of a, a fun tree. Um, it's also much harder wood. Um, and the grain is, is constantly twisted. The grain is just interlocking, so it's very hard to split. It's very durable. Um, it takes impact beautifully. Uh, it's just a really, really resilient wood. Uh, it takes forever to rot. So when these trees fall over in the wood, they stay there for years and years and years and years. Um, it's just a very rot-resistant, very durable wood, and that's why it is like the wood to use if you're making a ship. So that's why Tally Ho used it. So I'm using some five-minute epoxy here. Mixing up equal parts. And then I'm going to drip it in. So I'll drip this in and probably answer a couple questions while I'm doing that. All right. Well, Jimmy O says opinions on Japanese hand planes. We'll do that. Um, some people really like them. Some people really don't. You never know until you try it. Uh, it's a completely different style. You use different muscle groups. One is not better than the other. They are just uh, very different. You will tell. You will have some people who will definitely tell you, oh, yes, Japanese planes are much, much better than Western planes. You know, other people will tell you, no, Western planes are much, much better. It really doesn't matter. They're just different, uh, different mindset on the same possibility, taking thin slices of wood off of big slices of wood. And both will do very well. I don't use them because they require um, a different body mechanic that I really have not spent the time to master. One of these years, I'd actually like to dive into Japanese woodworking in a whole and build all of the tools needed for it. But uh, I have not gotten to that point yet. We'll see, maybe someday. So I'm trying to be careful not to seal this up so that when I drive this down, I don't get a huge air bubble. But I think I did just make an air bubble in there, so we'll see. Put a little bit of epoxy on the end of this. Set this into here. And then we can drive this down in.
Ta-da! Quickly flip it over, grab a rag. Because I don't want any of that epoxy that's dripping out or squeezing out to get into any other thing. So I'm going to wipe it all off. And it's basically ready to use. So Duck wants to know what the green container you're mixing the epoxy in is. This is a kid's cereal bowl uh, made of silicone, so it flips inside out. So once the epoxy cures, actually, let me show you. I think I have the other one from earlier. Yeah, so this one, the epoxy is cured on there. And so rather than having a paper bowl that you throw away and you're done with, this one you flip inside out. And you can scratch off all the old epoxy, and you're ready to use it again. And you get these perfect little um, epoxy skewer things. So they're usable over and over and over and over and over again, and I just like them. You can buy them on Amazon for like 10 bucks for a set of three. So, yeah, that's my epoxy bowl. Oh, I'm on camera one, sorry. My epoxy bowl. I thought I was showing you. Um, so... Apparently, I didn't show you any of that then. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I guess I was distracted by the blue dot. <laughs> so now it's all driven down in there, ready to go together. So let's put the saw together. Bring this over. Slide this in. Oop, go in. Oh, I'm pushing on the string, that's why. And then we can tighten this up with the string. And there, you have a turning saw. And it actually looks like a turning saw. The nice thing about this is now I can rotate the blade and turn it to any particular cut. So, boo-yah! <laughs> this, this makes me happy. That is what we have. So, yeah. Um, next time, um, I believe we're going to do the shaping of the beams and getting those all ready. We're actually going to do... The, uh, the continuous shaping all the way around, making the head much, much smaller up here um, and getting things ready. And then the next time after that, we're probably going to do a little bit of carving detail on here in the final work, as well as then applying boiled linseed oil and paste wax. Yes, I'm going to use boiled linseed oil and paste wax. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So, yeah, there you go. What do you think about it? Pretty. I like it. Any questions? Ah. Uh not at the moment you guys oh. got any questions gals cool um so yeah we're getting close to the end of this if you have any idea of what you'd like to see for the next live event um, i'm thinking i might actually do the live events uh as a a thing with my wife and actually teach her live that might be fun uh, though I'm thinking about how that actually works with the chat and if we don't need marital counseling after doing a live no <laughs> we'll see Maybe I'll bring JJ down and let him man the chat. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, seven. They wouldn't boy. understand the poor little mush mouth. <laughs> um, yeah, anything then? Uh, hey, one quick question. Uh, William Mueller says, I have a big, I have a huge piece of pin oak. Is yeah. this good for making mallets? Uh, yeah, pin oak is um, a type of red oak. Um, well, okay. there are many different trees that are referred to as pin oak, uh, but there's a specific oak called pin oak that is a type of red oak. Um, it is a, it's a very, very sharp and pointy uh, leaf. So the, the, the point, the, the barbs of the leaf all come out in a point, um, and they're all very thin and uh, sharp looking. Um, but it's a type of red oak, so it's a little bit softer of an oak, but not bad. I, it, it's, it's still a good hard oak. Um, actually, the tabletop is made of red oak, um, and I don't remember. No, no, that one's just regular red oak. Um, so yeah, it would make a great mallet. Um, and mallets, there. I mean, if you look at my collection, I have okay, on the bench. Uh, I have three mallets out right now. Earlier today, I had five different mallets on my bench, and I was using all five of them. And each one has a different characteristic. Like this one is made of cherry. It's much softer than the pin oak. And I even have leather on the front to make it even softer than that. Um, this one which I sent was a spalted maple and a walnut. The walnut in the center is even softer than that. Um, 
So sometimes you want a soft wood because you want the wood you're swinging to be softer than the wood you're hinting so that you're not denting your work, you're denting the mallet. Um, so softer wood is good for that. And sometimes you want a really hard wood. Uh, like this one is a live oak. This one is maple. Um, and you really want to whale and you want to drive that force home. That's where you want something harder. But then I also have a heavy with pine faces, ingrained pine, so it's a much softer face. Um, so when I get asked, is any particular wood good for a mallet, there's always some mallet that that wood is good for, but what type of mallet are you using? Uh, most general joiner's mallet, um, I wouldn't go anything softer than a red oak, so the pin oak would work well, um, but I wouldn't do anything like harder than um, a maple. Uh, maple is even on the hard side, but you know, uh, it would work. Um, but that's your, your general joiner's mallet. That's intended for more or less hitting your chisels and driving them in. So, yeah, hope that answers your question. I'm going to actually be making a mallet soon out of uh, live oak because the one I was using out at Tally Ho was not very good. So I'm going to make him one and send it out to him. All right, one more last question, just because. <laughs> Tim Elmore, what are your thoughts on boiled linseed oil and paste wax? Um, <laughs> you know, there are some people out there who really like it, and then there's there's some people out there who are yeah. addicted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I drink it for breakfast in the morning. Gives me my nice glossy feature. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I use it a lot because most of the things that I'm making are tools for around the shop or small projects, and for things like that, it is fantastic. It, it gives it a nice sheen. It still lets the wood show through. Uh, it's just a, it feels really good in the hand. So for anything hand tool wise, it is what I love. Um, but it's not a very good protective surface. So if I'm doing something like a table or a dresser or a coffee table or an end table or anything that's going to be in contact with a lot of people or anything that's in contact with my kids, um, I need a more protective surface. And so that's where I'm usually going to be doing like a uh, poly, you know, wipe on poly or um, uh, I'm going to be doing a Rubio monocoat on the table, something that has a, a slightly more protective surface. Um, so there is no right or wrong, but yes, I do like boiled linseed oil and paste wax. <laughs> cool. Anything else? No. I think that'll about do it. So um, yeah, come on next time and we'll be doing some of the shaping and starting to make this thing look really pretty. I'm looking forward to that. So are we going to go late next week, too, since I think I work on Tuesday? Yes, again? next week we'll probably be doing it late again, so it probably won't start until 8, 8.30, um, because my wife is working. But we will. Uh, I'll let you know, so stay tuned to my Facebook page, and that's where norm normally I'll post it. But, yeah. Um, and if you would like a quick and early look at the hand tool location map, um, you can do that on my Wood by Right Hive Mind group on Facebook. I just released it to them to get their ideas and see if there were any more sites they needed to add. So if you want to go, you can get an early look there. So, yeah. I think that's about it. All righty. Until next time, have a wonderful day.